such a privilege to be able to come before you and to be able to minister your word. Hallelujah, Lord God, I just pray this morning that this word, Father, would just be so anointed from you, Lord God. It would be from your throne, Lord Jesus Christ, to our hearts, and that it would heal, it would restore, it would mend, it would actually give what is lacking this morning, God, in every way. Because you have sent your word, Lord God, and you said in sending your word, it will not return to you void. It will accomplish that which you please. Accomplish what you desire this morning through your word. It's not my word. I'm first partake of this word, Lord God. So I stand, Lord God, like everyone else, to be ministered to by this word, because we all need to be ministered to, Lord God. So we ask that you would come, Holy Spirit, and that you would make the word clear in the name of Jesus Christ, remove any confusion whatsoever, O oh Lord God. And Lord God, increase our knowledge, our wisdom, our understanding as we sit before the word. And Lord, as we sit before the word, let your word change us, let your word groom us, let your word cause us to grow in grace and in beauty. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so... We're going to talk today about something that came to my spirit um, a few days ago, and that is restoration. And as you know, the name of this ministry is Restoring Church of the Living God. We had been um, given the suggestion about the Church of the Living God by one of our pastors in the U.S. And um, we decided when we were registering the church name to put Church of the Living God, St. Anne, as one of the choices. And then the next choice was Church of the Living God, Priory. And uh, then we decided beforehand, in case those two didn't make it, we were trying to figure out what could we do before the, either before or after Church of the Living God. So what came to us was restoring Church of the Living God. So we put in restoring Church of the Living God as a third option. And when we went to register the church name, the first two got thrown out. <laughs> Maybe because there are other people using Church of the Living God and they're established already in Priory and also in St. Anne. So the gentleman kindly turned to me and said, it's restoring Church of the Living God. I said, okay, this is going to be it. <laughs> so for short, we'll call it Restoring Church since it's such a long name. But what we thought about when we, the word restoring came to us was restoring lives, lives that have gone through some really bad situations. Um, restoring lives, not just physically, but mentally, spiritually, most of all, of course, financially and, and emotionally, all those things come into play. The greatest restoration is a spiritual restoration. And so this morning I want to talk about the whole idea of restoration, being restored. And the definition of restoration is the action or of returning something to a former owner, place or condition, renewal, revival, or reestablishment. A return of something to a former original, normal, or unimpaired condition. Think about it, a return of something to a former, what it was before, original, that's where it was in the beginning, normal, and we're talking about the new norm that has been introduced, mm. or unimpaired condition. Impaired has to do with being 
weakened or damaged, you know, like um, impaired blood vessels in our bodies, God forbid, impaired situations, impaired relationships, damaged. Restitution of something taken away or lost. So we we're going to get something back that was taken from us. The Greek word apokathistemi, which is spelled A P O K A T H I S T E M I. That's a long word. It means to restore to health. And so many of us are not where we were years before, where our health is concerned with different things going on high blood pressure, diabetes, um, kidney failure, we can name them. Some have had cancer, have had to be battling with cancer, and, and, and want to go back to where they were before all these diseases took place. Another Greek word is apodidomi, which is A-P-O-D-I-D-O-M-I, -D -D which means to give back. Um, I'm going to go back up to the first one, opokathistemi, pertaining to our health. In Matthew 12 and 13, we're going to see a demonstration of that Greek word, the returning to health, to what things were before, where this body was healthy. It's Matthew chapter 12 and verse 13. Okay, let me just give a little... Um, paraphrase here about what had happened Why we came to verse 13 Jesus had gone into the temple the synagogue on the Sabbath day and while he was there of course you know he's always looking God was, Jesus was always looking around for somebody that he could help while he was there he saw a man with a withered hand I'm not sure why they allowed the man into the synagogue because the Pharisees were very very particular but this man, I guess, might have been, could have been one of them or just happened to have been in the synagogue at the time. And he had a withered hand. And, and Jesus, you know, he, he was thinking that something needed to be done. It didn't make sense for this man to leave the, the um, meeting like that. So... The Pharisees, of course, they turned to Jesus and they said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day? Because they figured that Jesus being present, he would want to do something. He would want to be involved in restoring this man's hand. And so they, 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 didn't, even, <laughs> they didn't even wait until he approached the man. They went ahead and asked him. So... Jesus, of course, said, what man shall there be, in verse 11, you don't have to turn to there, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, because they wanted to see if he was going to actually heal somebody on the Sabbath day, which they were considered, you should not do such a thing on the Sabbath day. Okay, he said, what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep, and if it fall into a pit on the Sabbath day, will he not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore, it is. So he's answering their question right there, straight, straight up. It is lawful to do well on the Sabbath days. The, then verse 13 that you're seeing here now says, He saith to the man, stretch forth thine hand. And he stretched it forth, and it was restored. How? Whole. The way it was before. See, like as the other hand. So this right here is a demonstration of this Greek word apokathistemi, meaning restoration to what things were health, health-wise. How many of us would, would just um, want to return to that stable place where we're healthy? There, no more high blood pressure, no more um, blood sugar, high blood sugar, no more um, cancer in our bodies. And we're, there's some that we're praying for right now with cancer. But praise God, you know, we see that God is moving. Um, kidney failure. I mean, that's like a life, a, a death sentence when, when the doctors tell you, wow, look, 
uh, sorry, but you're, you're, you're going to have to be on dialysis, and that's going to be a lifetime thing. My dad was on it for years, and just this, it was disgusting to him after a while. It, 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 it just wears you down physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, you know, so how many of us would not want to return to that state where we were before? I'm sure all of us would. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 8, it gives us the illustration of the apodidomi, that um, version of restoration, Greek word meaning to give back. Now, I think most of us will remember that song we might have learned in Sunday school about Zacchaeus. <laughs> was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. <laughs> and where was Zacchaeus? He wanted to see Jesus. So he knew he did not have the stature. He wasn't tall enough to look above the heads of all those other people. He wanted to see Jesus. So what did he do? He was a smart man now. He climbed into a tree. <laughs> he didn't just say, tell his cousin and, and different ones afterwards, I didn't get to see Jesus, you know. <laughs> Because I couldn't see him as, I, you know, he could have done several things, climbed on a box or whatever it is, but he climbed into a tree. So in Luke chapter 19 and verse 8, um, we're going to see what happened there. He was, you know, he had an encounter because believe it or not, even though Jesus was focusing on the crowd and just always, always compassion was always just exuding from his being and he, he would just be ministering to people. He would see their needs. Even though he was walking around and he was just so intent on the needs of the people and ministering to the people, he looked up and whom did he see? Zacchaeus. So, of course, Zac he told Zacchaeus to come out of the tree. Because he said, today, today I'm going to dine with you. And, and Jesus knew exactly what he was going to do. He wasn't just going to eat with him. He wasn't just going to have supper with him. He was going to minister to Zacchaeus because Zacchaeus needed to be ministered to. So it says here in Luke 19 and verse 8, it says, And Zacchaeus stood, he stood, and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods, because you see, Zacchaeus was one that had, um, it, said, it said here in, in the verse, verse, verse 1, which you don't have to turn to, but it says, Zacchaeus was a chief among publicans and he was rich. Okay? So he basically had, had it in his power to, to give as much as he could or withhold whatever he could. You know, he was a, a publican. So when, when Jesus now, when Jesus started to minister to him, I believe he felt some kind of conviction. And he said, behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. Meaning, he wasn't doing it before. So he's going to do it now. The half of, or possibly he could have done that in the past. The half. He would give half of what he owned to the poor. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, and he was certainly in a position where he could have taken money or whatever it is, um, goods from people by false accusation. He had that kind of power, being a publican. I restore to that person. I give back to that person or that person or that person over there fourfold. So if he had taken 10, he was going to give back 40. I mean, wow. Amazing. You say, well, maybe he could just have given back 10. You know, that should be enough, really. But the, the, being in, in Jesus' presence and undergoing that spiritual surgery, so to speak, because when Jesus comes into our presence, there's a, a spotlight that he starts to shine into our very beings, into our spirits, into our souls. And by the time he shines that light into us, guess what? He doesn't even have to get us saying the word. You know what he does? When he shines the spotlight in, we just start to just 
speak up all kinds of things. We said, okay, Lord, if I have done this, if I've done that, please forgive me. If I've done the other, then I'm going to restore. I'm going to give back to this person. And in his situation, that's what he needed to do. And, and you know what? Maybe we should look at um, verse 14. Well, not 14. Um... Eight. We were at eight. Nine. I meant nine. Verse nine. Because that follows, and I can read it from here, that follows what he said. When he said that, and Jesus heard it, it said, verse nine, and Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for so much as he also is a son of Abraham, meaning Zac Zacchaeus. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. So that day, Zacchaeus received salvation. See, Jesus planted him in the tree. Isn't that wonderful? And he had to, he ministered to him and salvation came to his house. And what he needed at that point, when Jesus saw that, wow, this man is repenting. He is actually saying, wow, you know what? I'm, I'm not gonna just see myself the way as I saw myself before. So I'm humbling myself and I'm saying, wow, I'm going to restore. I'm going to give back. Restoration is also giving back. So we're going to see how things are going to be given back to us. Um, the Hebrew word for restore is Eliashib, which is E-L-Y-A-S-H-I-Y-B. And if you notice there, the first part says E-L, and every time you see E-L mentioned in the Hebrew, it refers to God Almighty himself. So, and then the other part of it, very interesting, it's, it's, it's called, it's Eliashib, but the, sh the A-S-H-I-Y-B part is really from the Hebrew word shub. <laughs> I'm thinking of the Jamaican term shub. <laughs> you know, um, it's like a pushing. But shub means to turn back or return to the starting point, generally to retreat. So you're here and you go back there. To go home again or to repent. That's what Eliashab shib means. So the restoration has to do with a going back to a former place. And when I saw repent here, I thought about going back to God's original plan for us. What was his original plan? To actually be on the same page with him. We came off that page because Adam and Eve fell into sin. sin. So things, things changed at that point. So God had to bring us back to that place through sending his son, Jesus Christ, so we could come back into that right relationship with himself. So there's a coming back from where we are now into that place with him, returning home. Home is where God is. Home is where Jesus is. And so when we don't know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have drifted away from home like the prodigal son. We have gone outside of that perimeter where he himself can shield us and guide us and nurture us. And so that's always the intention of the gospel. That's, that was always God's will that man would come back home to himself. That restoration has to do with coming back into right relationship. Repenting, saying, Lord God, I have sinned. I am so sorry for my sin. Cleanse me today. Wash me in your blood. I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, and I give myself to you. I'm coming back home. That's it, basically, in a nutshell. Have you ever caught yourself saying, I wish that my life could be what it was 10 years ago? And we start to daydream almost. We think back 10 years ago, 15 years, 20, 30 years, etc. When I was doing this, I was doing that. Things were really nice, life was sweet. I didn't have all this going on here. You know, I was enjoying this. Oh, why couldn't things have just stayed right there? I know that most of us have caught ourselves some time or the other saying, ah, I wish that it could have stayed right there and this hadn't happened. Things were better then, somehow. That's what we're thinking. 
What about going back to the days before the coronavirus? <laughs> no mask wearing, no social distancing, no restrictions here or there. Oh my God. And this just seems to me sometimes like a nightmare, like, like it's a dream and you're saying, okay, any day now I'm going to wake up. Shake me somebody, I'm going to wake up and, and I'll say, oh, it was just a dream. All this was just a dream. But then we wake up and we see people wearing masks and we're wearing masks and we're like, so, you know, we're going to look, but we're going to look at Joel chapter 2, verses 25 and 26. And um, God talks about the last days. And the last days, some would say, well, this seems like it to me. But the Bible says when you think this is it, it's going to get a little worse. Um, wars, rumors, rumors of wars, yes, we hear about all of that, famine, F everything, but you know what? We have hope in Jesus that when things begin to get worse, we can look to him, those of us who know him. It says, I will restore, here's that restoration again, I will give you back, restore you to you, the years and all those years that you're saying, ah, 10 years ago, man, I was doing this, I was, my business was blooming. Mm, mm, mm. And even before the coronavirus, businesses, some businesses were blooming, and now people are out of work, and, and we pray for them all the time because, you know, these are desperate times. But things were blooming. The years, the years that the locust, some maybe could translate here and put the years that the coronavirus have eaten. Just thought about that just now. The canker worm, the caterpillar, and the pommel worm. My great army. Oh, my great army. God says it was his great army, which he sent among them, which I sent among you. There's a reason why God allowed it. Okay, the next verse says, And ye shall eat in plenty, and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, that hath dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be ashamed. So all these things that people might be going through right now, they seem so devastating. And you're wondering if there's any kind of hope, any kind of retribution, anything at all, any restoration. Is there anything, is there gonna be any change or is this gonna just be a permanent situation? They are calling it the new norm, but this is not normal. People want to be restored. People really, nobody enjoys going through affliction continually or permanently. Each one of us desires some kind of a change, something where we can come back to health and peace and joy and just be whole, coming back to a place of wholeness. You know, there's a scripture that talks about the thief, and we can find it in Proverbs chapter 6, verses 30 to 31. I, I, I was, this came to me when I was um, writing this message about restoration. And it might seem strange, but it says, men do not despise a thief if he steal to satisfy his soul when he's hungry, okay? So if somebody is hungry, they're out of work, and they're desperate, they wanna feed themselves and their families, then you say, well, you know, I guess it would be fine. We don't really put that person down because that person has to go and steal to meet his needs and his family's needs because he's hungry. But, look at what the next verse says, but, oh Lord, <laughs> but if he is found, right? So he can get away, as long as he is not found, he can get away with it now. But if he's found or if he's caught, what is he going to do? You think now the judge is going to say, <laughs> uh, well, Mr. Brown, you know what? We realize that you were out of work and you just had to steal. I think that was the... The, the thing with Robin Hood, if you remember the Robin Hood 
um, tales, Robin Hood and his band of men would go and rob the rich so that they could give to the poor. And they considered that to be perfectly justifiable, right? Back in those days, that's how it was seen. And I'm sure as a child growing up and watching that, I might have felt that that was perfectly OK. But what are we reading here? There's a but. When there's a but, what does it mean? It means pay close attention. But if he's found, so if the thief is found, even though he might have stolen to meet his own you know, needs, and his family's needs. He shall restore how many? Oh my goodness, this is, this is really? This, hold on, is that the Bible? It is, is it really the Bible? Seven fold, seven times. Now Zacchaeus said he would give how many times? Four times. Here to say seven times. So if he stole $30, oh Lord have mercy. He has to give back $210. So where's he gonna get it from? He shall give all the substance of his house. So he's going to come back, back to square one, isn't he? But that's restoration right there. That's the law of restoration. So we, we think, well, OK, we're going to just get back just what the, the years that the locust and the palm worm and the caterpillar have taken from us. We're just going to get back exactly what we lost. We're going to get back that exact amount. No. With restoration, we're going to get back even more. Because through the process of losing, and, and it's, 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 it's a whole, it's a very stressful situation. You think maybe you have just lost your business and um, lost the monies that were attached to that business. But think about it. You have lost your peace. You have lost your joy. Um, in some cases, people have lost relationships, their marriages maybe were affected by that. So it's a whole lot more, if you think about it, that they have lost. There are two examples I thought about, and I'm not sure if I'm going to get a chance to do both. I see I'm not going to get a chance. <laughs> but I thought about Job. Job went through a lot. And, and I know we all know the story of Job. There was a time when I would not want to read the, the book of Job because I felt if I ever lingered in there, I might just uh, have to go through some of the experiences he did. So I would reach um, Ruth. I would reach, what's that book that comes before? Um, no, it is, oh my goodness, Esther. I would reach Esther, and then I would jump over Job <laughs> and go to Psalms. Oh, lovely Psalms. <laughs> and I say, I'm safe, I'm safe. And then, of course, some years ago, Wayne and myself went through the Job experience. And um, we're like, OK. It's like each time when God wants to do something in your life, you have to go through Job. You can't jump over to Psalm somehow. But let me tell you what, you will come out smelling like a rose. Job, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, Job was a rich man, but he was also a very godly man. He had a lot of assets, as you can see here, Job chapter 1, 1 to 3. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, perfect before God, and one that feared God and eschewed, he shunned. Evil. He didn't want anything to do with evil. And there was, were born unto him seven sons and three daughters. His substance also was 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she ashes and asses, and a very great household, a lot of servants. And so that this man was the greatest of all the men of the East. Okay, so he had all of these, the sons, the daughters, the servants, the houses. His, um, his worth was estimated to be, in US dollars, 790,000. 790,000. And so back then, that would be a whole lot of money. So he was really rich. Now, of course, his extremely severe tests and trials 
not only of his family being taken from him, but also his substance being taken from him began in verse 6 all the way through to verse 12. And I think most of us are familiar with what happened with Job. We're reading it and we're thinking we're watching a horror movie because how on earth is this man able to do this? There was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, the angels, and Satan also came among them, okay? And the, and, and the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth, shuns, doesn't want to have anything to do with evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for nothing, for naught? Okay. Has not thou made a hedge protection about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands, and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power only upon himself, meaning his body, put not, put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. Okay. So, in verse 13 to 19, his family is attacked because now God is saying, okay, Satan, you can, I'm going to let you, I'm going to give you this. You go and test him, but don't touch his body thus far. So, there was a day when his sons and his daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. And what happened? There came a messenger unto Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them. And what happened? The Sabaeans fell upon them and took them away. Yea, that's the oxen, etc. They have slain thy, the servants with the edge of the sword. And I only am escaped alone to tell thee. Next verse. While he was yet speaking, as if that was not enough, there came also another and said, The fire of God is fallen from heaven and hath burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I only have escaped alone to tell thee. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, The Chaldeans made out three bands and fell upon the camels and have carried them away, yea, and slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only have escaped alone to tell thee. While he was... At this point, some of us, I'm not sure what we would have done. Would have been okay. Something isn't right here. We would have had our hands like this and we'd be like screaming. While he was yet speaking, there came also another and said, Thy sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their eldest brother's house. What happened? Behold, there came a great wind from the wilderness and smote the four corners of the house and it fell upon the young men and they're dead and I only have escaped alone to tell thee. <sighs> Job, Job, oh my goodness, really. Um, so there was that attack against Job's family and his substance. So in Job chapter two, now as if to say, well, this is not the do doomsday for Job, it continues. Job chapter two, verses one to Five. says there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord and of course you know they're presenting themselves before the Lord as they always do and so the next verse says the Lord said to Satan so where are you coming from and he says yeah going to and fro to the earth walking down in it and the next verse says the Lord said to Satan have you considered my servant Job he said that in the beginning remember that there's none like him in the earth, perfect man, etc., etc. Still he hold, he's still holding fast to his integrity, even though you moved me against him to destroy him without cause, without cause. Satan answered, this is what he said, skin for skin. Mm -hmm. Yea, all that a man hath will he give for his life. 
So in other words, let me touch his skin. Let me attack his body and see if he's not going to just give you up because he wants his life, he wants his health. Put forth your hand now, touch his bone and his flesh, and he will curse you, curse you to your face. Mm -hmm. That's it? Okay, so, all right. So in verses 6 to 8, we see that Job undergoes physical affliction. All right, so Satan, the Lord says, okay, touch it. Because now he said, Job is now going to undergo an extreme test, worse than what he had undergone with his family and his substance being taken from him. Because now you're getting close to the man here now. This is it. Pain, torment, agony. All right. So, in he, between these chapters, and, and I decided I was going to read all. Remember I told you I, I would skip from Esther over into Psalms and felt like I was good and ready to go now. Well, after we went through some issues, not to say like Job in our bodies, but we went through some issues and um, with our family just a couple of years ago. When this happened, I decided I was going to read from chapter 1 right into chapter 42 of Job. I read the whole thing. In Job 42, after Job has gone through all of these trials and testings that nobody would want, in verses uh, 10 to 17 of chapter 42, Job had lost $790,000 U.S. Back then, it would have been equivalent to that. All right? At the very end of all these trials, what do we read? The Lord turned, turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends, because he had some friends that they were miserable comforters. They comforted him, but they also, more than anything else, tried to tell him, Job, you're going through this because you sinned against God. I remember the Bible told us that he was perfect in God's sight. Mature. Perfect means mature. He, he was a righteous man. He, he followed everything that God wanted him to do. So Job had to pray for his friends because God was upset with how his friends just constantly, constantly berated him. They, they thought they were encouraging him, but they were saying, you did something wrong while all this has happened to you. So God said, you pray for your friends because you need to, 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 um, to do sacrifices for them that I will accept on their behalf. And when he had done that, when he prayed for his friends, also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Twice. Think about it. He gave him twice. He had, um, the next verse I think showed us, is that the one? No, 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 that's not it. No, 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 it's okay. All right, so whatever he had, the amount of sheep, um, camels, whatever he had before, they, that was double. If he had 7,000 of this, 10,000 of that, the seven became 14, the 10 became 20, etc., etc. Um, and and look, at, look, at, look at the restoration that was taking place right here. People even... They came and they visited him, they, they encouraged him, they brought him money. I mean, wow. And this, this, this man was rich before. So look, look now, even though 719,000 US equivalent was taken from him, you know what happened? Now, he had in, in substance because of what happened with the restoration process, the, this is the order of restoration, God's order of restoration, Look at what? God blessed the end of the latter end of Job more than his beginning. He had 14,000 sheep. He had seven before. 6,000 camels. He had three before. 1,000 yoke of oxen. He had 500 before. 1,000 she asses. He only had 500 she asses before. He also had, now he didn't have 14 sons, I noticed, and six daughters. He still had, but remember those died. So he got seven more sons and three more. I mean, really. And so now his total, um, and of course he talks about the daughters in this last verse. Verse, um, what verse is that? 14. 14. 
yeah, it says that these daughters were the fairest in the land. Okay. Um, what's the next verse now? And the other verse says, after this, Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his daughters. Hold it right there, please, that verse. Now, so Job had 790,000 US equivalent before. Now he has $1,580,000 in substance. Double, double. He got double for his trouble. And I just saw this on Friday. Job, when this whole thing started, he was 70 years old. 70, seven zero. So now, how old is he? 140 years old, right? After this, after, after this happened with him, he lived for another 140 years. He lived, that double again. And I've never seen this before. That's double. He didn't just, he didn't live like another 70 years, you know, um, to enjoy the rest of his life. God gave him double. I mean, what kind of God is it that we are serving? You know, um, and so I just wanted to share that because sometimes we feel like we are stuck in, in situations, in places in our lives, and we're not going forward. And we keep saying, ah, oh, I wish the good old days would return. Well, the good old days can return, but even better than the good old days. Because see, see God blessed Job in such a way that he gave him double for his... He didn't just give him back what he lost. He gave him double for the trouble that he went through. God is in, still in the restoring business, and he can restore. He can restore our minds. He can restore our emotions. He can restore our health. He can restore our spirit, man. He always wants us to come back home to himself. Because in himself, really, there is just fullness of joy. There is so much. You know, he's a restorer of the breach. He restores things that we thought really would not even be able to be revived. If he could raise Lazarus from the dead, then guess what? He can raise your situation. He can raise my situation. He can bring us back to that place of plenty and satisfaction all around. So I just want to give him all the praise this morning, all the thanksgiving that he, there is hope in Christ Jesus and that there is restoration for each and every one of us. And if you're, you've been just despondent, discouraged, and trying to make sense out of what's going on in your life, just know that Jesus Christ can restore the former things and greater than the former things for you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for that wonderful word of restoration. Just to know that as we as his children, and he loves us so much that he gave his only begotten son. And if he restored Job with all that was taken from him, wouldn't he also restore each and every one of us that things that were restored, that was taken from us, as it said in the Bible? But that's what he wants for us. He wants always the best for us. So with that said, we have faith and surety that our God will, will, will replenish and restore what was taken from us. May not be in exact way like Job would restore it with, 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 with uh, more children and more uh, substance, more, more money and more cattle and sheep but it may restore us in other ways in other ways that we would have preferred or the Lord might have best for us, no best for us to, us to be restored in so we thank you for that for that teaching, thank you for that um, understanding of what and who God is in our life as his people so we thank you God we thank you for your word, we thank you for the understanding that we can go forth knowing that even it may be taken from us tomorrow, Lord God, that the day after it may be, it will be restored. And we just thank you, Lord God, that you are our Father, you are our restorer, you are our provider in everything and every way. And for that, Lord God, we just thank you, we glorify you, and magnify your holy, precious name, Lord God. 
And again, we thank you for sending your son that we can come to you in the situation, in any situation that we might be in. Lord God, and we just glorify you in your precious holy name. Jesus Christ, our Lord, and amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. 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 Thank you.